start this evening is around income generation ideas for track and field clubs who either manage their own facility who are, who are or who are contributing to the upkeep of the facility the idea is around sharing of good practice so we've got a club also um, who'll be presenting this evening and then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions um, and then we'll have a bit of an open forum at, at, at the end So what the session is, is going to cover, this is going to provide an overview of the facility and the budget required, different types of income generation, the time and effort involved, achievements and, and successes. So I'm going to hand you over now. What sat with me is Kev Lincoln from the Doncaster Athletics Club. Kev is going to share with us um Doncaster's ideas on income generation what's worked for them really well over the last 11 years or so um I'll hand you over to Kev now we'll start the with the first slide which is around the club overview right okay <clears throat> can uh, everybody hear me now Yeah, I think the yeah, everybody yeah. here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, we came to the key moat at Doncaster in 2007 um, as an amalgam of uh, various local clubs because there wasn't a, a track as such in Doncaster at all. And uh, to be fair, there were some risks involved, and some of the smaller clubs couldn't even see us generating the annual rent, which in that time was just under a thousand pound a month and they were worried about having to find that money and um, being able to pay the way of course none of the utilities or business rates anything like that applied at the time um, but that grew as the club changed its uh, structure from the outset we were a company limited by guarantee so there were a board of directors etc and um, we had about 120 members 12 coaches and around £1,500 spare in the bank. Before then, um, there were just small decisions to be made really by the, uh, the clubs joining the format of Doncaster AC. And um, in the first few years, we were very frustrated at the fact that we were sharing a facility with um, footballers, rugby players, and they were just abusing the track, the facilities, the toilets. The arm's length management company that was run by the council was very inefficient. They didn't understand partnership working and they didn't place any value on the site or indeed uh, any sort of passion for it. It was just a, a business of profit without looking at the future. So after five or six years, I, um, I went to the local mayor and uh, it's always important in these cases to have a political ally and some places are lucky enough to have a mayor who is one individual who you can talk to or you're having to talk to a leader of a council or a, a senior councillor with some responsibility for facilities they agreed eventually to uh, to sign us up for a 25-year lease and we are uh, six years into that lease next year but before we got anywhere near that i was very very uncomfortable about the um, maintenance costs that we might be left with the day after we signed the lease so before the um, <coughs> track mark situation came into being we paid about 300 quid for a, an independent assessment of the whole site that includes the electrics the state of the track the hammer net the jump beds all that sort of thing including the toilets etc and we identified um, quite a lot of maintenance that were coming down the line a couple of years after we'd signed the lease. And bear in mind, the site was only five or six years old by this time, and it should have been in better condition. In the end, um, the council agreed to place £62,000 in a deposit account for us to access, uh, which we've just spent the last couple of grand this year, actually. So it has been well spent, and that money identified by the council that obviously things ought to have been done better in the past and it helped us to have a cushion for the eventualities that we we're going to face later on. In this year um, <clears throat> the club is now 
11 years old. We've got over 600 members, 35 coaches, and an annual turnover of about 120,000. Bearing in mind when we took on the lease, there was a deficit of 60 grand. It wasn't in real terms anything that we should worry about, but the business was going downhill. So it needed um, a different focus, a different identification of partnership, and identifying how we could make better use of the site when we've got seven day access. And that's really the start of the journey um, in deciding where we wanted to go. <coughs> um, we are a full comp competition track um, up to level two. Um, we have the pleasure of uh, hosting all sorts of events over the year. And it's our reputation and our professionalism and also the good condition of our equipment and the friendliness and willingness to help and support any customer that comes along using our volunteers in the best way that we can. Um, but to start the ball rolling, you need to have some vision. You need to have some aspiration and you need people behind you who can actually help to carry things forward. So the cost needs to be identified as a daily ongoing expenditure, medium and long term. And you have to agree with service providers as well in terms of the long term payment of plans, such as uh, we spent £24,000 on the floodlights, but the company involved gave us 18 months to pay. And we needed a site office. That was £11,000. And again, the company there gave us 12 months to pay. There was a consideration of operational costs in coaching, bursary, bursaries, equipment, uh, buses, competitions, etc., which you have to build into all that when certainly schools are attending and to keep the prices at a reasonable cost. Uh, one of our gainers is our tuck shop, which earns around £10,000 a year. Okay. Are you like coming? Yeah. I thought somebody was trying to say something there. Okay, I'll carry on. Um, the tuck shop has been always been there from uh, when we moved into the site in 2007. It was a storeroom and we, at the time we had some good joiners and electricians and they actually put the tuck shop together in terms of the cupboards, the storage, the freezer, fridge and all that. And um, But we also had a market from the football supporters um, who also attend there to play football, the parents of children. So we began to change the stock to fit the um, needs of different types of customers. So to be fair, the tuck shop ticked along at about five, five, six thousand pound initially, and now it's up to ten thousand pound and increasing um, as we try to get hold of the uh, the type of stock that people want to see. Remarkably, one of the big sellers is Bovril, particularly this time of year with black pepper on it. We can't get enough of it. Um, the toilet facilities, uh, we've got control of those as well, but we have a, a very good cleaner. Um, she's not employed, but she's paid cash for a couple of, couple of hours a week. And we have a professional company coming in once a month to service the air fresheners, etc. There's an annual utility cost of about £8,000, which we share with the Doncaster Rovers. And um, we always ensure that we've got a minimum reserve of £2,000 for an unexpected cost. The reserve would normally have a lot more than that in it, but that would be the minimum we would ever go to. Uh, general servicing as well of fire extinguishers, grass cutting toilets, etc. Um, and a decent insurance policy. These are all things that um, you would uh, look at in terms of reducing risk as you move forward to make sure that when you are responsible and people are paying to come, that you've got all the aspects of uh, their safety, their enjoyment and um, the state of equipment because it is your responsibility. Okay, thanks Kev. Mm -hmm. does, does anybody have any questions at this point? Please feel free to, to, to unmute and, and ask any questions or, or type it into the, uh, the, the question chat box. Hi Anna, can you hear me? Yeah, I can yeah. hear you, yeah. Oh, marvellous. That was me trying to get in. I've just been fiddling with your little box. This is Tony <laughs> Bajolda from uh, Paddockwood Athletic Club. Hi, Tony. Um, 
got a six lane track. Um, we, we don't have any, uh, we have a couple of one, two, three porter cabins uh, for, uh, for odds and ends, containers for odds and ends. Kevin, what, what, what's, what are your sources of income? Because with 600 members, that's a lot of outgoings. Next slide. Well, what we've tried to do um, is we, we provide five different types of membership. And it ranges from a social member who just pays 30 quid to run uh, from the track around the roads of the locality, right up to um, 126 pound a year, where members get a key to one of the gates. So they've got 365 days access to the track when they want, as well as those on membership nights. And there are other uh, types of membership in between that based on age, etc., and usage. But those that use the track pay the most and um, i would say that generally speaking um, membership fees across the range would give us an annual intake of probably 15 to 16 thousand pound based on the type of membership they've got uh, which i think is a, is a very good deal but of course you do need to have full access to the track uh, to actually do this and one thing i would the question i would ask you is what type of ownership lease document agreement do you work under at your club at the moment to give you the freedom to actually operate how you want yeah we have a 25 year lease with with the town council which um, gives us a certain amount of freedom do you do you have public use of the track do you allow outsiders to rent access uh, yes, we do. But um, in keeping with the insurance, one of our members, usually myself or, or somebody else who's been on a facility management course, is there to actually um, operate the shop, get any equipment out, help the customer as much as we can. And certainly in June, you can't book our site for the next two years in June because, um, <coughs> excuse me, all the schools come for the sports days. And we also have uh, coaching agreements with different schools where they pay for coaching. So um, it is about actually opening up the track to um, as many vendors as you can. Uh, we also have team building um, sessions for private companies and um, they, they pay for um, changing rooms, they pay for catering. Uh, as well as the coaching activity to actually improve their fitness. We also have corporate fun days, sports days, um, as well as the Norman track and field stuff. Uh, we have um, a Tamil community social day on a, on a Sunday for all South Yorkshire. And these are all things that are built in that bring revenue over the year to ensure that we can meet our targets. So they're, they're some of the things. We also have a Saturday morning club for five-year-olds up to eight-year-olds that is very very popular and we have 60 to 80 children in that and um, they all become junior members one, once they reach eight and come into the club during the week um, and then they are entered into certain competitions uh, we buy in branded club kit as well which we sell at a profit and we're now looking at purchasing a ready-made food trailer so we can expand on our burgers, chips and all that sort of thing, which we sell currently from a gazebo when we've got the appropriate track and field event on. Um, so that with the tuck shop and the burger sales uh, from a school, we can generate anywhere near up to a thousand pounds for the day's use. And um, in most days in June, we'll be doing that. That's fantastic. Yeah. One other question, how do you provide for future refurbishment of the track? Right, um, well, when we signed the lease, we um, we got the key players together for the club, not just directors, but team managers, coaches, some members. And based on a survey that we had done at the beginning of the process five years ago, we identified the um, areas of the track and equipment that were in need of immediate attention or replacement there was then a medium term and a long term the long term ones we just completed which was a 45000 pound expenditure on our back straight and that completes the process which actually uh, spookily lined up with the track mark process which came in just in time 
So we're now setting about planning our next five years. And uh, within two years, we need 45,000 for the two bends. Because uh, we've had the, the final straight done and the back straight done, as well as lane one recovered completely. Um, so we're working on that now and we're, we're more or less uh, on our way again. Right. <laughs> when I said ours was a six lane track, I meant to say we're actually a two four six track, <clears throat> which was a sort of experiment, I think, from um, EA, which is working quite well now, but it's now getting overused. So we we need to expand that to full six lanes all the way around, which is going to be interesting. The one thing I'd say to you is um, you need to plan long term. It's no good thinking about recovering your track if it's due next year. Um, to recover eight lanes over 100 metres, it costs us £46,000, and that included VAT. That needs to be planned for. So you need yeah. to look at the wear and tear on your track. If there are things you can do, for example, like prevent use of lane one during training or something, then those are the things that you'll need to consider. But also, if you've got some um, porter cabins or signage there, companies currently pay a thousand pound to us to put a sign on the back of our stand. We pay two to 250 quid for the sign and then we keep the rest. And that company sign is there for as long as they want to do. So when we have businesses come in and do work for us, we do talk to them about advertising what they do. So we've now got a plan drawer, we've got a solicitor, uh, we've got a porter cabin builder, and these have all taken up these offers and we've got their signage and the additional sponsorship. So that's something to think about. Yeah. All right, thanks, Kevin. Is there any other sources of income there, Kev, that you just want to highlight? before we move on? Um, the, the one other area I would say is that we run three big road races a year. Um, we have the Sandal Beat 10K, the Big Doncaster Town Centre 5K, and the Cusworth 10K. Those three races generate about £9,000 profit at the end of the year. So uh, that is something else to think about. Um, and also the new Doncaster Half Marathon, which is not organised by us, but we open up our facilities for the children of roadrunners who are actually doing the race and we entertain them with local races and things and they obviously spend money in the shop and it also generates new members for Saturday etc. So all the time we are looking for opportunities if you like to raise funds and uh, incorporate what we do with as many people as possible. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Kev. I think I think that was really useful to hear the different types of income. And I know this is in relation to a club who actually own the facility and run it the, themselves. But some of the principles behind it and some of the types of the ways they generate income can be replicated for other clubs who don't own the facility. So clubs who are contributing to an upkeep of a facility um, or just general ideas around income generation for clubs depending on what what you want to spend it on i think the big message that came across there was having a long-term vision and a plan for what what income you do need to, to to generate to the next one okay time effort right um on the screen um i mentioned a couple of things any organization to sustain a future must have aspiration and a long-term vision and there are two key important elements here. One I've touched on earlier, which is to reduce the risk. There's always going to be a risk and you need to find ways of reducing that. Um, things that I talked about were to get a good uh, commercial insurance policy around you with obviously uh, the proper cover and also a good workable club structure capable of sound decision making. This is not about one person taking on all the responsibility and trying to come up with the answers. And it doesn't always work to try and generate aspiration, long term vision at bog standard monthly committee meetings, when a lot of the time they are just talking shops and nothing ever happens. 
we got together we get together every saturday uh, every six months for two to three hours in a local club we provide sandwiches and free drinks and we invite 12 to 20 key people within the club and we talk about and make decisions about what the membership fee should be what the costs are coming down the line which are the priorities how much we need to find how we're going to do that you then need to identify the people who are going to action those decisions and tie them into time schedules so that the results of what you've decided and the decisions are actually made you hold people to account there are ways of doing that without being uh, rude or anything about it but it's about getting that passion for your club and running a club is not just about coaching every night it's what happens behind the scenes so that you can say right within two years we need to do something with this track and we need to have the money available to do it so the club finances we are we carefully control them and i have to say every year at the agm i pick out three or four key um, cost centers such as the tuck shop and compare the income generation over a period of years and you need to do that so that you can actually program in what extra can be done to raise more funds and which areas actually need some more work so members are always interested to know where the money's coming from but more importantly where it's going and i just think if you've got those structures in place you keep your members on board and you demonstrate that you are actually on the ball in terms of knowing your club knowing its financial strengths determining an aspiration and a plan that is actually working and being delivered then you'll get more people involved but i talk to many clubs these days where it seems to be down to the chairman to try and sort things out and nobody else really uh, is doing much so you know that that would be my message to you get your team together keep them on board and decide what you're going to do with the future kev can i just ask a question mm. on the club structure yeah um how did you decide which legal structure should be and was that was that almost dictated to by the amount of income that you was bringing into the club did you have to change it based on the income that was coming in well one thing we found that when we signed the lease um and because we are a company we were we would have to pay fifty five thousand pound in uh, business rates as well as ten thousand pound in domestic rates and also um we would have to pay corporation tax based on the income when we explored that um a community amateur sports club a cask <coughs> is exempt from all those things which we found out so obviously we went off to our um accountant and for a small fee we were transferred to a cask status that doesn't mean to say we lose the um, directorship or the company status because we don't but it's like a <coughs> excuse me it's like a uh, a sports charity and it also entitles us to a special dispensation dispensation from the council every march so that we have a domestic rate uh, reduction as well on top of all that so the only thing we have to pay for are the utilities and also obviously the insurance that we've got all the rest we are exempt obviously we can't be vat registered but i wouldn't wish us to be anyway um so that is another important feature of this is the actual structure of your club to meet the financial burdens that you may face if you don't get this right okay thanks kev has anybody got any questions on that before we move on to the, the final slide They're all going to sleep. Hello, can you hear me? Hiya, yeah, we can hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Hi, yeah, just a, just a quick one from... Oh, you've, you've, just, you've just dipped out a little bit. I'm not sure who it was who was speaking. Do you want to try and type your question in the chat box? 
Somebody's typing now. Oh, really helpful. Hi, Ellis. You've just you've just dipped out. Um, struggling to hear you. Would you like to type your question in the chat box? Oh, thank, thanks, Michelle. Just seeing your comment. Glad it was helpful. Just waiting for Alice to type type a question. If anybody's got anything else, do you pay for your coaches and operate payroll? Right. Um, do we pay our coaches and do we operate a payroll? Um, as a cask club, you're not allowed to employ anybody, uh, which is actually a, a good thing. Um, but you can pay expenses to people up to a level of £10,000 a year. So we have certain people who do certain tasks that we do pay cash in hand. Um, the cleaner, for example, who cleans the toilets. Not a very pleasant job, um, but she is paid for two hours a week. And that actually increases in the summer when we've got more schools in. Because one thing we are famous for in the area is good quality toilets. <laughs> uh, if there's a, a repair needed, they, that's affected. Our members paint them out every year for us. And uh, we have a professional company dealing with the air fresheners. And also we buy in all the toilet rolls and all the rest of the stuff. In terms of coaches, we pay um, a couple of young coaches who are currently having just left university and waiting to go into the world of work. We pay their expenses to get to the club um, so that we can keep them on as long as possible. Uh, we pay for all the coach courses as well. And, <coughs> excuse me, all the club coaches get free drinks on uh, training nights so in that way, we, we do try and value them. Um, but we certainly don't have a payroll and we haven't got any permanently paid coaches. OK, thanks, Kev. Has anybody got any other questions? I can see some more people type in. So Michelle Hewitt, do you charge weekly training fees to your members or just ask for a yearly membership fee and no weekly payments? Right, well, the three membership uh, elements that actually pay the most are those that use the track. They are annual fees. We don't charge track fees, except if a member, for example, who is one of our pacers, who was paid just to run with the pacer group on the road and wants to use the track on an occasion, then um, we charge them three pound a session. <coughs> but other than that no um but we we do we just signed a contract with the local tri club who use our track on a wednesday evening for a monthly sum and that gives them access to the alarm and the lights etc <coughs> excuse me and there's another way of uh, getting some income in so that's that's what we do <coughs> thank you is that okay michelle oh thank you great see a few other people typing we will have some more opportunities for questions at the end so if you do have any others can jot them down oh thank you for me too paul ray's typing now How much is your yearly fee? How much is your yearly fee? Right, the uh, the top range is um, £125 for the year. And that is for anybody over the age of 17. And um, they get a key for one of the gates. It doesn't fit anything else. But it is accessed 365 days a year as and when they want. It then uh, comes down in terms of the age range, the length of access. But everybody who is using the track in some way has to pay the most. The least we charge is £30 for a social member who just trot around and don't represent the club in anything. 
we have the pacer group who are road runners who are members and can actually access races for the club we charge them 52 pound and that includes obviously their uka fee and their north of england two pound affiliation fee the under 11s they are charged just over 100 pound and on a saturday the fives to eight year olds are charged 100 pound for the year um, and as you can work that out with 60 of them that's uh, quite a good bit of income and with that they get a free shirt when they join as well which are good quality and we give them a little christmas party as well before they finish at christmas so um they love Kevin, us to be I build, excuse me can i build on that saturday morning club do you think it's a yeah. fantastic idea um you, you you charge 100 quid for that now but the standards of our um charges at the moment that's that's a lot of money but is it is it by the sound of it, it's extremely popular. Do, do, you, do you have any trouble getting 100 quid out of folk for that? Uh, no, one thing I haven't mentioned is that um, for the last 12 months, we bought a sum up, I'm advertising you, we bought a sum up card reader. And you know, most of the parents that bring the kids on a Saturday don't bring any cash, they have cards so payments for various things have just rocketed on we've taken about eleven thousand pound on the card in 12 months what was that machine you said it's called a sum up card reader you can get one off the internet for about they're about 19 quid and you you, you have to apply to the company concerned with your constitution etc to make sure you've got proper financial governance yeah. but once that's in um they, they take a very very small percentage and, you, and it, the money goes back into the club account within three days it's very very good if you haven't got one i would recommend it for the person who works in the office but so for those kids on a saturday you don't charge a hundred pound annual fee it works out at what sort of two quid a week does it it would work out at that um we do have people who are financially not well off and we'll let them pay in instalments if they want to do you Thank know. You. we also have some people who don't pay anything uh, because they are actually struggling but we do actually explore that we don't just take it as red yeah yeah thanks okay one more from martin lee and then we'll move on to the next slide what is your weekly average numbers of junior participants if you can pull that off the top of your head. Um, from the age of eight up to 17, um, this time of year, we have half the teams are in indoors on a Tuesday and half the teams on a Thursday. But I would still class that as training. I would suggest we have round about three to 350 every week. We have partnership agreements with two schools one which is next door who have a massive sports hall so we use that on a tuesday and a thursday for free and that school has their sports day and free access to our site for training all year we have a similar arrangement with another school who have our saturday club in their sports hall on a saturday between october and march and they also have a free sports day and access the track for uh, their student training so if we were paying for those sports halls, we'd be paying just under £10,000 a year. So we make that uh, a good agreement. And of course, when those schools come for the sports days, we open the tuck shop and they usually clean us out at about 500 quid a session. So it's a win-win situation. It's about partnership and it's about you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours and it works very, very well. Okay, thanks, Kev. We'll move on to the, the final slide before we open it up to if there's any, any other further questions. So successes and achievements. Right. Um, well, we, we're very proud of our site. We regard it as a high quality venue and um, I shall be going through the equipment with a couple of our coaches in a couple of weeks to make sure that we've got all the correct equipment ready for next season. We keep a locked equipment cupboard, so the general uh, club members use other equipment from the general storage 
We save the good stuff for the competitions, which we supervise ourselves. We also, we've had three planters made by a local man for nothing. We plant out flowers in there in the spring and we've had planters put on the front of the stand as well, which really does improve things and gives it a friendly atmosphere. <coughs> we've also tied in the under 11s training with some of our road runners. So the mums and dads can go off and have a trot around the streets and leave the kids safely with us being coached by um, our friendly coaches. We have a volunteer workforce always keen to help us. Every year on a day in March, on a Saturday, we have about 40 volunteers. We do all the paint the toilets, get rid of the weeds, fill the sand pits up, all that sort of stuff. We feed them with bacon sarnies at 10 o'clock. They get free drinks and we buy pizza in the afternoon. And by four o'clock, the track is turned around, ready for our first event, which is usually our open meeting in, in uh, Easter. And we're on with that now. Um, I mentioned the card, <coughs> excuse me, going cashless has been an absolute dream for us. Um, people just don't carry cash anymore. And it's a big loss if you're relying on that as a club. I've mentioned support from local communities and partners. We're big on that. But the business plan at the centre of it all um, is the prime success. You need to know where you're going. You need to know how much it's going to cost you. And you need to know where you've come from and carry everybody with you. So it's a tangible thing is passion. And you can actually capture that and get everybody involved in, in whatever you're doing. And we have an annual awards night, which is in March when we subsidize our members and uh, we have a sit down meal. Everybody gets dressed up. We have uh, guests coming along and we bring together all the aspects of our club in one night. And uh, we usually get three to 350 people there and it's absolutely brilliant. All the kids get dressed up. They all get on the stage, have the photos taken. And we, uh, last year we had, well, this year we had Beth Dobbin there to present the prizes, um, an ex-member of ours. So it's about valuing people as well and making sure that everybody knows about our success and we have a good relationship with the local press as well. The, um, <coughs> excuse me, the um, Hall of Fame, um, this year voted us in as the uh, club of the year which we're absolutely delighted with um, never dreamt we'd ever get anything like that but I think for us it's not just about the club and achievements it's about having a great site that we're, we're proud of and that everybody is part of and I think really that's probably what swung it on the day but um, we're very pleased to be in the position that we are, I must say. Right, that brings us to the end of the presentation. Thanks for Kev for giving up his Friday night and inviting me into his, his house. Does anybody else have any, have any further questions that they wish to ask Kev at this point? Whether it... Anna, if we need to follow up with Kev on anything, can we... Would you mind us having an email address or something like that? No, it's fine. Yeah, I can circulate. I can circulate that. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh. Oh, hi, it's Ellis. Sorry, I I missed the um the beginning of the presentation. I had a, a Wi-Fi failure. Uh, but yes, just to the previous um um uh, commentary, if we could get a copy of the presentation, that would be uh, that would be great um so just sort of uh, so what i gather i mean you've done a, uh, an amazing job in terms of funding the club um in in terms of, of volunteers uh, what sort of level of volunteers do you support at the club so coaches and you mentioned 40 that help with the maintenance of the facility but how many sort of coaches and sort of officials are you also running through the club um, off the top of my head, we've got um, we've got about fourteen officials. 
mainly level one, but we've got a couple of level two in there as well. Um, we ran a bespoke yeah. course for, just for us uh, last January because we could yeah. see it was a problem. Yeah. And we set monies aside the year before yeah. to pay for all the participants. Okay. Um, in terms of coaches, including, right. our, including our lifts and the track and field, we've got 30 odd of those. We pay for the courses, we pay for the high vis jackets, and mm -hmm. of course, uh, they are included in our annual awards night as well in, in the work that they do. Um, we try, right, to, we try right. to share the success of all our athletes and members and coaches and volunteers. And I must say, whenever we've asked for anything, like have we got an electrician who can do this, that or the other, we, we don't, we're not short of people who are skill based. Yeah. So the more we can get done within right. the club, the less we're having to, to spend, really. Right. OK. All right. That's great. Um, but we're just in the process we we operate a very small club albeit with a waiting list um on a cinder track uh, and i'm in talks with the local council and, and they get to negotiate a long lease and to renew the surface we're, we're, we're lazing with a journey german company to lay down a product called fast track which means that they can lay it on top of the cinder track um which, which has a tartan finish um I'm looking at sort of potentially uh, uh, needing to fund around about 250k um, from what is effectively a, a town rather than a city population. Um, given your sort of expertise, what sort of advice would you would you offer for such an endeavour? Um, did you say you got the lease for the site? Well, I'm currently negotiating that with the council. Right, well, my approach would be that um, you are taking on a community facility here and taking some risks moving forward yeah. that you are removing from the local authority. I would get yourself a decent solicitor yeah. local and agree a business meeting with the mayor or the leader of the council, whoever it is. And also, it would be useful yeah. to have a site survey in terms of the maintenance that is coming to you over the next few years, including the improvement of your cinder track. I would be unhappy if the council yeah. would make a significant contribution of at least 50 to 60% of that expenditure. They can't sit back and expect you to find that. That is yeah. just right. Um, that's the attitude I would take. Um, and it's easily achievable with the right sort of approach and if you've got something like yeah. uh, an athletic-backed utility survey, which actually highlights some costs that you're going to have to face to, to make this happen. But at the end of the day, you are providing yeah. community fa facility for local people. You're helping to reduce obesity. You're yeah. improving children development, all this. And you're doing it for now. So you, you need to take that view when you go to the council. Great, thank you. Paul, oh, if I could suggest it, chase down the Section 106 money from the council, which is the stuff that comes from builders when they overdevelop your area. That's a, that's a good suggestion, uh, but make sure you get in early because yeah. Yeah. it needs to be applied for the year before it's available. And as you can imagine, everybody's after it. So um, and there will be a, a councillor within your area who is responsible for the 106 funding for yeah. your area so you need to find out all that is and is, is that is that a year a calendar year in advance or a fiscal year in advance it's the fiscal year because they actually just out the 106 money yeah. in the march ready for april depending how much money we've got okay okay that's great advice thank you okay you <laughs> I'm not sure which um, we're all from a variety of different different areas. Your club support manager from England Athletics will be able to also advise and help um, if considering potential asset transfers or accessing funding as well. That's one of our roles to help clubs with that. 
So what, what we can do is we can circulate who your yep. local um, club support manager is after that to be able to help. Okay, does anybody have any other questions for Kev at this time? I can see Paul's typing. Oh. Not, not from me, but it's been a great presentation. Great, thank 